technology out there and all the options, the modular systems, the rail systems where you can mount lights, why would you revert back to using a handheld light instead of your weapon mounted light? Well, <clears throat> it's an interesting thing and it's not popular anymore. It may be in some areas where, say, uh, law enforcement has like the most low light experience and maybe not the most low light training but they they undoubtedly have the most experience because their job is 24 7 most of the problems are at night so <clears throat> uh, most of the most violent problems uh, for the most part can be at night but it can happen anytime but anyways um, Back when you didn't have rails around and uh, you know you needed to use a shotgun or a rifle or whatever, or maybe you still, uh, maybe they're still part of an agency that doesn't have a way to attach a light to a rifle. Um, maybe not like this one. I don't think there's very many agencies that have bullpups, except for you know the ones in Philadelphia near IWI. Um, but <clears throat> uh, there may be some agencies still that have to use. Uh, handheld flashlight techniques and there's plenty of reasons why you would too as a civilian or we as civilians would be using a handheld light so I'm gonna go over those and the the idea of using handheld light with a rifle is not optimal however I have found myself using a handheld light in conjunction with the rifle on a, a few occasions so um, <clears throat> First things first is uh, one of the things that they say is be good with these techniques. Find a technique that works for you with your rifle or rifles or uh, shotgun maybe. Um, that's a whole other video working with a uh, handheld with a shotgun or even a mounted one. But anyways, the one uh, biggest issue is failure because you can't count on everything working all the time. Something will happen. Most popularly, which I experienced when I was in the military actually, was the light that I actually had. Um, uh, I had an old Surefire Scout, one of the first uh, ones, you know, a couple hundred lumens or, or whatever. Uh, I still have it. Um, and it attached to the rail, but the tail switch that, uh, the tail switch, uh, you could switch it out and get one of these tape switches, uh, one of the first ones. And that wiring sucked. It was not durable at all. And, uh, you know, it, with too much heat during training, it ended like from firing it with uh, with that tail switch on and it being near the vents of the M16A4. Um, basically, what happened is it kind of melted the wire a little bit and compromised it, and the tail switch uh, or the uh, the tape switch failed. And so I was only able to use it with the uh, tail switch, um, which basically meant that I would only be able to use it on constant on. Now, when you're operating in overseas and stuff and you're actually allowed to use white light it's going to be spot checking until you actually get a target um, <clears throat> so it, it's a little bit different than uh, law enforcement or uh, civilian usage but you know equipment can fail and so that's you know one of my little anecdotes for that uh, so I didn't really trust uh, tape switches for the longest time but I'm giving this one a try apparently they made advancements. Uh, this is a Phoenix uh, PD35 with a tail switch that works with uh, plenty of the other, uh, a tape switch that works with uh, others that have similar uh, butt plates on them or uh, switch plates or back plates. But anyways, um, the other thing is they say use a handheld light uh, to get the light off your center of mass. The, the fear of people shooting at the light. Um, since the um, uh, since LEDs have come on the market and high lumen flashlights have come on the market, you haven't really seen that many instances of people shooting at the light and with much of any success because high lumens typically will wipe out your um, your your vision for the most part uh, as long as it's on there and it's really hard to get direction of where of where it's coming from because it just washes everything out um, and the beam will seem this big. You know, in front of you, it'll cover a, a wide amount. Try it. Uh, try it with a 500 lumen, uh, you know, 600, 1,000. It's going to wipe it out. Uh, so even if you're very close, it's going to wipe it out. But once that light comes off, 
you know, you'll get, you may get an idea, but that's why the user moves. But that's one of the other arguments. I don't think that's really a strong argument given the high lumen uh, lights that are out there today, um, especially the ones that you could mount, uh, mount to the, the weapon. So that was one of the things uh, that was listed. And the other thing is you might not have an attachment on your weapon. So with a rifle like this, uh, this doesn't have an attachment. And if you know anything about these roller delayed blowback rifles, this is a 308. I love this rifle. I've had it for years. Uh, I had it uh, slightly modified in the barrel, uh, make it you know a couple inches shorter to where I have a 16 inch barrel, a bull barrel, so it can take the heat because I really run rounds through this thing really fast and it can get hot to where I can melt the grips or melt gloves or whatever. Um, I, with this wide forearm grip, I, I don't really get much of any heat off of it and that's really what it's pretty much designed for is to take that heat and the bull barrel does a pretty good job. But anyways, there's no way for me to really attach a light here unless I was to like drill a hole, drill holes, which is, you know, it, it's something you could probably do. I don't know how the clearance would be with the barrel. Um, if I was to put like one of those Magpul rails, so I'm not even gonna attempt that because this thing is hard to get off in, in the first place because of the bull barrel with how thick it is. It grabs on really tight. So anyways, um, <clears throat> Uh, when you're working with something like this, uh, you you could get a rail. You could get a rail system for this. However, it's going to cost. Um, it, it's going to probably cost uh, $200, 300 dollars, may, maybe one hundred and fifty. It, it depends on what you want to pay. Uh, and I don't see the point in doing that when I already have pretty a pretty solid technique for working with this. And where I'm going with this, and why I bring this rifle out specifically is because I actually use this for moose and bear on the property. Not necessarily like small game like dogs or whatever, that's what a pistol's for, for my property anyways. But <clears throat> I had to come up with techniques for searching. And, you know, I'll talk about the different techniques next, but this is just an example. It doesn't have an attachment. Some rifles do not have attachments. You might have the old school A2s. You may have a hard time finding the attachment hardware to get them into the vent holes to where you can get a light and then a tape switch, um, I mean, are you willing to invest in that or is it, is it likely that you're going to have to use your light a lot? Are you in a profession where you're going to have to use your light a lot? I don't really get that many visitors as far as like a lot of moose or <clears throat> especially bear around here. So I don't really use this rifle all that much to say hello uh, to, you know, guests on the property. So. Uh, I'm fine with just having a handheld technique and plus this thing's so low recoil I can shoot it with you know one hand and just barely supporting it and using you know a syringe method of spot checking or doing a cross support where I just go like that and we'll talk about those techniques next using this rifle. Now depending on the weapon system these techniques may not work because of how heavy this thing is up front because of the bull barrel adding a little more weight um, or make it up for the fact that it's not an 18 inch barrel anymore. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you're probably not going to be able to use the first method I'm going to talk about, which is the FBI technique, or at least you can't use it for much of an extended period of time. Basically, you have it up in your shoulder like this, and you have it out, and you're scanning around, and you can scan however, just get it off your center of mass, and yeah. It can be pretty fatiguing with all the weight up front and there barely being any buttstock. Um, it's really hard to get any support with this kind of rifle. Uh, the main concern with the FBI technique is probably the long story. <clears throat> somebody could tell it a lot better, but basically the idea is get the light off your center of mass in case somebody shoots at you. Um, and they're able to center in and they're shooting at the light. Uh, I could understand if it was a very low lumen light because it's not going to wash out your ability to see things and focus and see the point of origin uh, like the old incandescent lights maybe a mag light even the big mag lights probably are not going to have enough lumens to actually wash out somebody's vision it may be bright but it's not going to be enough to where I can't center in on where that light's coming from and shoot at that it's kind of like the video games uh, like what was it Battlefield 4 or something like that uh, where you're able to shoot at the people with the lights because uh, it, all it was was a little speck and of course it was illuminating but you could see the hot spot of the origin but it, it's not really like that when you're shining a big light it washes out a good amount 
So I'm not too worried about that, especially in my experience. Uh, having had these lights used on me before, uh, it doesn't completely incapacitate things. There are risks, but part of the job in defending yourself or, you know, part of the job of uh, having to go in there and take care of business, you know. So <clears throat> uh, the FBI technique is mostly something that you'd see used on like submachine guns or ARs that don't really have any attachments because this rifle uh, can weigh about nine pounds, eight, eight nine, dang near ten pounds depending on uh, it being loaded what's on it. ARs can get up there when you attach a lot of things um, and you have a lot of gear on their sights, uh, maybe a uh, maybe a coupled magazine, uh, a laser system, like uh, one of the IR laser systems that you can buy, maybe uh, you know a, a light that you're not using or something like that, a heavier rail system, uh, grips or whatever, uh, it can add up. So yeah, it's probably not going to work for everything. Maybe just something that's very light, maybe an SBR that has uh, not much on it. Uh, but anyways, <clears throat> That's the FBI technique. Not very useful in my opinion unless you're you're sure that there's something right around the corner and you're just gonna go boop and you're gonna extend it out. You know, maybe uh, flag the light around to uh, draw a silhouette out or make sure that a silhouette or a shadow is a shadow and not an object that you're mistaking. <clears throat> so anyways, that's the FBI method. The next one is the one I talked about earlier, which is the cross support, which is kind of like the Harry's for the pistol, which is basically all you're doing is you're resting your arm like a bench right there. And there's different methods uh, for this depending on your reach. I mean, you can have it, you know, basically right out here. You can have it at a 90 degree angle and you can even hug the rifle. This doesn't really work with this rifle because of how far out it goes. On ARs, it would work a lot better because you can actually hug an AR and uh, you can get the stock into where you can hug it and keep it in nice and tight. And so this is probably the method I would use and there's different ways of using it. But what I like to do is I like to actually get my hand up like this. And that way, you know, it encourages the rifle to go inward more. And I don't really have a problem with it being offset like this far. Some people would say, no, it needs to be right here. Well, I don't really have a problem with it being, you know, in as far as it wants to go. Um, I can achieve about a 90 degree, uh, a 90 degree bend in my arm and shove it into my shoulder. Um, but I'm taking basically the weaver stance with it, but the sacrifices you have to make in order to get the light uh, in line with the bore and where you want it to go. Uh, it's not so difficult aligning the light like with the FBI technique. You need to make sure the light is staying aligned with where you're pointing. That can take a little bit of coordination and practice, depending on what you're trying to do. Uh, <clears throat> with this one, it's pretty easy to do, especially if you bend your wrist up and you're going in line and having it up against the magwell. It sets it in line pretty well. It's not going to be perfect, but <clears throat> it's going to be enough to direct that light where you're, generally where you're probably pointing the rifle. So, you know, that is what it is. But that's the cross support technique. The last technique is the light touch. Um, this is kind of an interesting one because it requires that your pressure switch, uh, your tail switch, can actually be activated against something flat. This is a Phoenix TK09 and most Phoenix lights from what I know you can actually put it against a flat surface and you can you know set off the light. That's not really the case with most stream lights. There's a couple of stream lights that don't have any uh, tail switch guards up here where you can't you know, set it up. Uh, a lot of people, the one of their tests for their tactical lights is that they can set it on the tail switch. They can set down the light on the tail switch and it'll stay there. You can't do that with a Phoenix. You can't do that with some lights that actually have tail switches and that's what you're gonna, that's the kind of light you're gonna need with this technique is you want one that can't stand up on its own on the tail switch because you need that pressure pad to actually be able to go off when it's against a flat surface. So that's what the light touch is relying on. And it <clears throat> can really only be used with a uh, light that has a tail switch. Now because this, this thing has a bell on it, depending on the light you're using, if it has too much of a bell, it's gonna point more downwards. So basically what I do, instead of just holding it like this all the way around and then touching it against the magazine, what I actually will do is I'll do kind of a syringe technique and hold the 
uh, hold the rifle like this with my thumb and index finger and then I'll just use these three fingers to pull back and then you know activate it from there and that way I have basically a, a two-handed grip a pretty close form to a two-handed grip and I can search around I can spot check and stuff like that and that's you know ideal I guess you could say somewhat ideal but it, it it gives you a little bit more stability, but if you're shooting something like an AR, maybe even this, they don't really have too much recoil, so it's not really going to throw you off that much. Now, if you're shooting it in a modified FBI stance, like in an, F, not in an FBI technique, then yeah, it's probably going to throw you around a little bit, and trying to control the recoil, maybe not in an AR, but, you know, in this thing, yeah, you're going to be uh, going a bit over, and you're going to have to concentrate on keeping this stable more than keeping this in line, but it'll just be a nice balancing method of uh, rubbing your belly and patting your head, you know? So, anyways, there's ways to get it and do things and, uh, like, if you're on your own property and you're not worried about your position because the, you're not worried about the animals, the moose or the bear ambushing you, then you just keep the thing on constant and you basically hold it up like this, you get your two hand, kind of two-handed uh, hold on it, and, and there you go. That's what you get. But I find that with the syringe technique um, against the magwell, I'm able to keep it in line more. See, the problem with this is when I try to hold it like this, it'll slip off to one side or the other. It'll try to flop around, mostly because of the bell. Now, if you have something that doesn't really have a bell, you'd probably be able to get it a little better. I just flipped it around here to kind of demonstrate. You can probably keep it in line a little better just by getting a, a nice tight grip with the support hand. but you know, I find getting the syringe technique on and uh, basically holding it like it's a syringe or a cigar or whatever, uh, just holding it like that and then just holding the, the hand guard like so with my index and thumb, I can just hold it like that. And that's really all I need in order to be able to control the recoil is to pull it into my shoulder and, you know, there you go. And that's going to be enough for me to be able to control the recoil on rapid fire with this um, with this rifle. But it depends on what you're using. Now let me go ahead and uh, talk about using a handheld light with a bullpup. I've basically been a fan of bullpups for as long as I actually started using rifles or was interested in them as a kid. They just looked sexy to me. And as I was using an M16 or M4 when I was in the military, I really liked the concept of the bullpup more. Uh, they were overall shorter, and they gave me the same barrel length and range. I just liked them. Plus, they were sexy. Why not, right? So, anyways, um, over the years, I also got more attached to them because I found that the downfall to the, the reload speed or whatever, um, that it's not really a downfall if you're actually trained on it. Uh, so, anyways, not really much of a bullpup rant for this video, but I thought I'd just add it in. So, anyways... Uh, for the bullpup, you can hold it in here. It's going to be a lot less stressful. You can stay like this. You can shoot one-handed. You can fight one-handed uh, with this kind of rifle. Uh, and it's not really going to be much of a detriment uh, over time. Now, the Steyr AUG versus something like the IWI Tavor or the X95, the weight is in the middle, right? Above your hand. So. Uh, you're not really getting much weight out here because there's no real attachments out here. All the weight, uh, especially the fixed sight, is right here. So, you know, the AUG is going to maybe fatigue you a little bit uh, sooner, but it's not by very much compared to, uh, uh, in comparison to the Israeli uh, bullpups. So, anyways, um, for bullpups, it makes things a little bit easier, especially for the uh, Steyr AUG. So basically, let me go ahead and demonstrate this as if I have a Tavor. So this is basically like the Tavor or X95 or whatever, where basically you have a slanted, you know, trigger guard area where it's just uh, a little bit slanted, right? You can't really do the light touch technique unless you're going to point down, and it's not going to really do any good for you. So what do you do? Well, I would say use the cigar method and just... Uh, uh, basically use the cigar method but have your thumb on the other side of it and just wrapping your fingers around it like a P90 you just sit there and you direct 
direct it from there. That's an option. If you have like the Tavor or whatever, maybe you can actually do that. But <clears throat> uh, for the AUG, it makes it a lot easier because you can do the light touch just like this. You can just direct it like this. It makes it a lot easier and you can still apply that rearward pressure. It's not going to be that hard to do. Uh, you can also do the crossing technique where the cross support technique where you leave the um, you leave this grip down and you don't wrap around this grip you actually wrap around here and I can actually get it snug really tight and then you know I can camp my hand inward like this in order to direct the beam in front of the rifle and I'm good to go so you know that's that's how versatile it is uh, for having a bull plug bullpup plus I can do the FBI uh, technique and stuff like that I can do anything I want really with the bullpup it's short compact uh, it's easy to work with and you know it, it makes using a handheld lighter doing any other task with your support hand easy so I so I like bullpups for that reason it makes using a handheld light very easy because this hand is always good and free unless of course you have to reload which Reloading a rifle or even a shotgun with a handheld light in your hand probably not going to be as easy as reloading a pistol, but that, I'm going to save that for another video. But in the in the general scheme of things, you got to practice some of these techniques, and I would go for a get training at a low light class. Don't sit here and try to be self-taught on YouTube. Um, but this is just a little discussion points on you know, how you do have options for using a handheld light. It's not something that is archaic. There are still purposes behind it. There's still uses behind it because of necessity. I'm not going to spend a thousand dollars, you know, setting up uh, my PTR uh, to have a light on there and all these other attachments or whatever. I'll just work with what I have and a handheld light will work for that. So anyways, um, the next thing is get training practice and once you uh, start practicing after getting trained find out how to make it work more efficient for you find your techniques and then you have another tool in your toolbox not that hard don't need to sit here and say well there's no reason because my light on my rifle always works okay well that's up to you but in my opinion you know having more tools makes you a little more handy so anyways, thanks a lot for watching. Go ahead and subscribe, and I will see you guys around.